have as had, shall will, make and must, might, could, would, should, do, does, did, done, is, was, were, are, have we been. Miss Tweet, helping verbs. All of us start out a presentation with your helping verbs. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about implications in, in the various forms in which that affects us on a daily basis. And I'll also explain up front why I so much appreciate Oak Grove. At the time I showed up at Oak Grove as a 10th grader, I had gone to seven different schools and had good experiences and had bad experiences. Just prior to enrolling at Oak Grove, I was with my aunt and uncle up in the farm near Thief River Falls. For those of you who know the area, St. Hilaire was closer. And my aunt was not only a farmer, she was also a school teacher. And she said, John, I want you to make absolutely sure that you start the year the right way. First of all, make sure you show up on time. Now, getting up on the farm was no big deal because we had chores to be doing and the chickens would announce the fact that they had a deposit for us and the fellows out in the hen house were crowing because they had something to do with it. The cows were also saying at that point, time to be milked. And the pigs and the other animals were also announcing the fact it was time to get up and get at it. But there was one day usually during the course of the month when my uncle did not get up early enough and he should have. And my aunt would complain to him about the fact that one morning he wasn't there when he was supposed to be. So he came up with an idea which I adapted but his idea was, well I should also tell you parenthetically the reason he didn't get up early is because his buddy Carl had come over the night before. And Carl and my uncle would solve the world's problems. Here were two guys who were really smart, very well read, although they formerly only had eighth grade educations. And they would stay up until late at night solving the world's problems. Now what made it all that more interesting is that my uncle George was a very staunch Republican. And Carl was an absolutely outspoken Democrat. And while there were no bad words used in our household, you could certainly tell how committed they were to their position, shall we say. So I would go to sleep with that droning downstairs, and I would wake up to KTRF radio signing on at 5 o'clock in the morning. Now many of us are old enough to remember that Television stations were not on 24 hours a day, and most radio stations were not either. Most radio stations would sign off at midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning. They'd sign on at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the morning. So on those mornings, after hearing his sister's complaints, two brothers and a sister were on the farm. After hearing his sister complaints about not getting up in the morning, my uncle would tune to KTRF radio. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, they'd play the Star Spangled Banner. They'd have some announcement about KTRF radio being on the air. And they'd get into their programming day. Concerned enough I was about getting up in time to go to Oak Grove, what I did was to tune my radio to 790 on your radio dial, KFGO. At 5 o'clock in the morning, the Star Spangled Banner would be played. The announcement would come on about KFGO being on the air. And this song would be played. Now I asked Bjorn if he would please to give us the right note. Would you please? One more time. Close. So for those of you who remember that hour of the morning on KFGO radio, Please sing along with me. <laughs> There's a car for you and a truck there too at WW Walworth. And the price is fair and you want them there at WW Walworth. Hey there friends, now don't go away. You listen 
to what I've got to say. There's a car for you and a truck there too. At WW Walworth. <laughs> Nobody's singing. <laughs> His radio name was Lem Hawkins. He was on the air on two different occasions. That's what I woke up with for three years <laughs> while going to Oak Grove, getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning. It ranks alongside of Brill Cream, a little dab will do you. Brill Cream, you look so debonair. Brill Cream, the gals will pursue you. Simply rub a little in your hair. <laughs> or liquid handy handy out cleans them all, cleans anything, anywhere, and won't scratch dull or wear. <laughs> liquid handy handy. <laughs> Not bringing any point. <laughs> Goodness. So my aunt was pleased that I had this regimen in place to make sure that I'd get to school on time. The other concern that I shared with her was, would I be accepted? I had these other school experiences. In some cases, I mentioned before, they were good. In some cases, they were not. So I went to school with some fear and trepidation, wondering whether or not I'd actually be accepted by this school where I knew, knew no one in my class, knew a couple of juniors and a couple of seniors that went to the church that I was starting to attend here in Fargo. And after the first day at Oak Grove, I wasn't sure I wanted to be accepted. I say this with love and affection for reasons I'll mention in a few minutes, but the reason for that trepidation was a person by the name of Miss Jackson. <laughs> we were told those of us who are new, mostly freshmen, those of us who are transferring in, to show up in the gymnasium at noontime after having a quick lunch. She wanted to meet with us. Probably 30 of us standing in a circle around her. She said, we are going to have a welcoming service for you. Some people call it a commissioning service. The welcoming part I understood the commissioning part, I didn't understand at all. I had been to a commissioning service down in Jackson, Minnesota prior to that for my sister and brother-in-law who went to Brazil for five years as missionaries. <laughs> I'm not sure I wanted to be shipped out anywhere from Oak <laughs> Miss Jackson said that for that service, you will remember these verses. Beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, and present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your faithful service. And be not conformed to this, conform to this world, but be ye transferred by the renewing of that mind, so that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Why do I remember that? Because she went around that cir circle, handing each of us a little mimeograph piece of paper with those verses on it and stood in front of each of us the first time as we were reading that off. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. I heard that 30 times <laughs> that morning. We had the service, and Miss Jackson was there. We were all to stand up, turn around, look at the audience. Students and some adults were there. She stood off in the corner over here like Mr. Elmas, who was our business, who was our band and choral leader. She directed us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your faithful service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and the faithful and perfect will of God. That now joined the list. Liquid handy handy, I'll clean them all. Anywhere and won't scratch dollar wear. Hey there, friends, now don't go away. All this stuff swimming around inside of my head. Now, Miss Jackson, in my time at Oak Grove, did me two wonderful favors. 
one was helping me memorize those verses even though I had no clue what they were supposed to mean for the next 30 years. Now, as time went on at Oak Grove, I realized I belonged because I understood what the three Lutheran laws were, which we all understand here. My family and my relatives, various relatives I had lived with, really helped me understand the Lutheran laws. Number one is you should be sure that you're never first at anything. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we had a pretty good basketball team at Oak Grove. And it was easy to lose because you're supposed to. <laughs> but when you win, what are you supposed to say? Many years later, I'm a dean of students at one of our little colleges within the Lutheran community before I started my business. And on staff with me was John Mellon from Kindred, North Dakota. And he disliked the fact that when we played them, we won. I found myself, we were reminiscing about some of these games where we played person on person, by the way. Scrappy little player who fouled too much. <laughs> and he was saying, you guys had a really good team, and I found myself saying, well, you know, we were lucky a lot. I'm not supposed to talk about the fact that we were better prepared, or we had a marvelous coach sitting back in the corner there who prepared us to win. This idea of being number two also worked better in a lot of other situations. Think about getting on an elevator. Black building downtown was a particular challenge. If you were standing near the elevator and the doors opened up, what you would do, of course, is hold the door for other people. In fact, Lutheran boys were often thought to be wonderfully courteous because they were great at opening doors. <laughs> Well, the reason for that is that we weren't first. <laughs> now, the trick with an elevator is that you open the door, but you don't want to be the last person on. Because if you're going up to the fourth floor to Dr. Kostelecki's office, who's a particularly <laughs> popular dentist at that time because he actually straightened teeth, <laughs> you didn't want to be the last person on because then you'd be the first person off. <laughs> so you're just hoping in that crowd of people there'd be some good Methodists and Presbyterians. <laughs> then you didn't have to be concerned about that. <laughs> so rule number one is never first in anything. Rule number two is you got to be feeling guilty all the time. <laughs> if you're not feeling guilty about something, clearly something is wrong. <laughs> There was this notion that I had at one point in my life as to why don't Lutherans have confessionals like our Catholic friends? It didn't take me long to figure that one out. If we had more formal confessionals and confession booths and we would go up there and we would knock on the door, the first thing we'd say is, I'm sorry for interrupting you. <laughs> this won't take long. Bear with me. We'd do our little piece and we'd get up and we'd head for the door and we'd say, oh boy, that was too long. And we'd get right back in line. And go up and say, I'm sorry for taking so much time that time. It would be a loop of Lutherans. <laughs> Once again, going to the church that invites a lot of other disciplines would be a far better idea. Particularly the Presbyterians and Methodists and some of the covenant people too are pretty good. So rule number two is you've got to be feeling guilty. Number three is if you're having a really good time, clearly it's sin. <laughs> my aunt was particularly sensitive to this. My uncle George had a wonderful sense of humor, and he would go into town, and he'd come back with all sorts of stories. And we particularly enjoyed Ole and Arnie stories. So he'd come back, and he had a story like, but Ole and Arnie went to the lumberyard. Because Ole's a smart one. He stays out in the pickup. He sends Arnie inside. And Arnie goes up to the clerk and he says, Ed, you know, we need some 4 by 2s And the clerk said, what? And Arnie would say, Ed, we need some 4 by 2s And the clerk would say, you do mean 2 by 4s don't you? And Arnie would say, yes, Kurt, I don't know. I'll go out and talk to my brother Ole. He's a smarter one. <laughs> So he goes out and talks to Ole, and he comes back inside. He says, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it's two by fours we want. <laughs> and the clerk would say, well, how long? Arnie would say, you're this, Kurt. I don't know. I'll talk to Ole. So 
Sam goes out and talks to Old and he comes back inside and he says, Well, we need it for a long time, we're going to build a house. <laughs> and my uncle would tell that story and he would laugh and laugh and laugh and his sister would say, After the laughter comes the tears. <laughs> And would instruct us and say, boys, it's fine to have fun, but tone it down a bit. And even when the pastor in church would have a funny line, you would learn how to chortle. Elmer Carlson, our neighbor, unfortunately, didn't learn that. And he would stand out every time because he'd laugh right out loud. And everybody would look at him, there's Elmer. So I figured out very quickly at Oak Grove that a whole bunch of other people understood the three Lutheran laws too, and I felt very comfortable. My time at Oak Grove was wonderful. There are three moments that I remember particularly, and one of those moments is really germane to this moment because of two people who are in this audience. I showed up as a sophomore transfer student, so I wasn't eligible to play sports that first semester. Coach Peterson saw something in me and invited me to go out for basketball right after the first of the year. One of the first days in March, we had our first tournament game, and he came up to me and he said, John, how would you like to dress for the A-Squad for the first tournament game? And I said, I'd love that. Unfortunately, what I did was I ran over to Jackson Hall, I grabbed stuff out of my locker, I started going out the north doorway, I tripped and fell headlong through a window in the door. The blood is going psh, psh, psh. I'm running up to the front of the building and there is my coach and there is Mel Mo. He's desperately grabbing for my belt, putting it around my arm. Mel Vina took over at that point. And those two people literally saved my life. He also happened to be a wonderful chemist. The second gift that she gave me was when I was a junior, she would have conversations with students under the headline of, How are you with the Lord? <laughs> those of you who knew this steely eyed person who's countenance was enigmatic. You really didn't know where she was. In fact, some years when I had my first visit with a client over the Louvre in Paris, I'm standing in this group of people that are looking at the picture. And if you know anything about the picture, you know that people have speculated for years, what was she thinking in that moment in time? Was this just before a smile, just after a smile? Was she musing? Was she daydreaming? What's going on in that head? That's how I felt every time I looked at Miss Jackson. If you combine that with a good picture of Buddha, you really understand who Miss Jackson was. <laughs> and I say that with great affection, I do. Her classroom was a very interesting classroom. You made sure that you had both feet flat on the floor. Everybody had to have spiral bound note uh, notebooks. She would have this big three ring binder and she would open it up for, for the entire hour she looked up. And it was our job to copy down as much as we possibly could every word she had to say. And while she's looking up, she's still aware there was that time when she stopped and she said, Mr. Brecky, God is here. <laughs> Which confirmed for me that simply channeling God in that moment. <laughs> in fact, one of my classmates said, there's no way in the world when we handed in our note notebooks every two weeks for her to read. There's no way in the world that she's reading through all those notebooks. So Donnie wrote in the margin of his, I'll give you a dollar if you get this far. <laughs> he got his notebook back that following Monday, and she never said anything to him out loud. She wrote in the margin, put this dollar in the offering plate. <laughs> so this is 
Miss Jackson is going to have that how are you with the Lord conversation with me. <laughs> this is the person who had given me those verses that I couldn't shake for any reason. Right alongside of those songs and dear Lemuel Pugh Hawkins and his morning introduction to his radio show. And she said, so, John, how are you with the Lord? <laughs> what was I supposed to say? Here's this person who's channeling God. What, what, what good answer can you have? So I decided to do something which was not unusual, but it's risky sometimes. And that was to tell the truth. <laughs> and I said, I don't really know if I understand this faith stuff really well to really consider myself a Christian. I'm sure my heart was beating, beating rapidly. It could be that by the end of the day I'd be going to Fargo High. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. And her response was, this was the first wonderful gift she gave me, her response was, good. I didn't know how to respond. She just kept looking at me with these eyes that were really looking through me at the wall behind me. And she said, when you come to a clear understanding of faith, it won't be because you're a student at Oak Grove. It won't because be because of the way you were raised, the families you've lived with, the church that you attend. It will because you have a personal relationship with Jesus. Whoa! Those verses were interesting and they came back to haunt me just a little bit when about a month ago I decided to meet our president and visit the campus. It's been a long time since I've been there. Mike invited me. Came on campus, not sure where to park, and parked on the street so I could make a quick getaway. Walked across the campus, not exactly sure where I was going to go. Met a couple of students who were very helpful, a couple of staff members who were helpful. I'm saying, this is Oak Grove, but it's not my Oak Grove. And I was really disappointed. We had a chat in Mike's office for a while. We moved around the campus. I'm not recognizing much. Where's North Hall? <laughs> the classroom we had at North Hall smelled like a gymnasium. Only because they had some bedrooms upstairs for guys who didn't fit into Fossum Hall. Where's North Hall? Where's Fossum? I had that one game as a junior that was a perfect game. Did all, not everything. I had the feeling I could drop kick the ball from center court and it would have gone in. <laughs> At one of our reunions, we were talking about the teams that we had that were pretty good teams. And so I'm talking about that game as a junior and nobody on my team is recognizing the heroic exploits I had in that game. <laughs> <laughs> Until Jake said, you know, I remember the game when you tripped over the basketball and you wiped out one of the cheerleaders from the other team. <laughs> Same game. <laughs> Fossum Hall's not there. The music rooms going down to the chemistry lab are not there. The music rooms for Ophelia Brunswold was my voice teacher for a year saying, we're going to find your voice. I really want to understand how to sing. We're going to find your voice. And we tried, we desperately tried. <laughs> and the last time I saw her, this little platinum blonde lady gave me a hug and said, John, we tried. <laughs> so I'm walking around this campus with Mike and I'm seeing these new buildings and I'm seeing students who actually look like they want to be there. <laughs> Walked to the new chemistry lab. On a reflex basis, I'm looking at the ceiling. Anyway, wrong room. And when I left, I got to my car and I left very quickly and I drove two blocks. And I pulled over to the curb. And I cried a little bit. What I do more than anything else in working with senior leadership teams in some very, very large companies 
is to help them think about implications in the midst of change. Companies used to go through change. At the end, we say, well, we restructured, now let's get back to doing business as usual. The smart companies in this day and age are saying, change is a constant. We need to constantly be morphing ourselves to figure out how to be better. And guess what? That's just the experience I had when I went to Total Growth. Literally, thank the Lord that Oak Grove is not the Oak Grove that I experienced. And then you have people that are part of that school that are always trying to figure out how can it be better. Now the constant is the message that the gospel has for each of us. That's the constant. But how that gets delivered, the teaching methodologies that are being used, the manner in which kids are learning by understanding that kids learn in a variety of ways, those things always need to be on the cutting edge. When I was going to college and then grad school and chasing a couple of degrees, I was in broadcasting in Minneapolis. Worked a little bit in television, mostly in radio. And one of the radio stations I worked with was a Christian radio station. I enjoyed my time with them. When you listen to that radio station right now, they don't play the kind of music that I enjoy hearing. Because much of what they do during the day is to appeal to a different audience of people who need to hear the message differently. And it's upbeat music, it's hip-hop, it's rock. And when I hear about their ability to attract people to the gospel message, doing that, I need to stand back and say, whoa, for me the outlandish music that I played at that station was the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> and now what they're doing is understanding the audience is shifting. And they need to reach that audience using different methodologies. Oak Grove must always change. Ultimately though, what I have to say boils down not just to those two verses, which I'm going to ask you to repeat back to me in a couple of more minutes. Ultimately it boils down to what do we see when we look in a mirror? What do we see as we take a look at ourselves and the support that Oak Grove deserves. I lived through that period of time going back to Oak Grove after the first 20 years of being there and having a sense of comfort because things hadn't changed. And then heard about student enrollment, heard about student attrition, heard about faculty attrition. Now I come back to those two verses again. This is not the point when I want you to repeat it with me. But this is the second lesson that Jackson gave me. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The scripture is saying to us constantly, grow up, grow in faith, figure out the other ways of being influential in the life of other people. You don't compromise the basis of what the gospel is all about, but what you do is constantly look for other ways to bring that to other people. The fact that Oak Grove is looking for supremacy, my language, not yours, in terms of a strong academic environment. I receive that. I'm thankful for the teachers I had. For him opening up the door to me with chemistry. Because my intention was to go to medical school. And even getting to the point where I was accepted and finally realized it was somebody else's dream, not mine. But he took what was an obtuse subject and made it real for me. But through the life that he lived too that I witnessed, in that setting, running cross country and playing basketball had a profound influence on me. So what do we see when we look in the mirror with reference to Oak Grove? The kind of person who champions the growth and change? The kind of person who is waiting to open up the pocket and help the school financially? 
and the kind of person who thinks wistfully, yes, but at the same time says, I'm encouraging this place to become different while hanging on to the core message of what the gospel is all about. With me. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is with your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good, acceptable and perfect will 